the Whips have agreed that item 19, the motion on the Grenfell Tower fire, will be taken next. Can I ask Councillor Govindia to move and Councillor Hogg to second the motion in their names? Councillor Govindia? Councillor Hogg? Seconded. There are speakers on this debate. I think Councillor Govindia, you're going to... Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yesterday I was at a meeting where John Barradale, the Chief Executive for the City of London and who is leading the London Gold Command operations in North Kensington, described the events at Grenfell as the most significant, complicated civil emergency since the Blitz. Those are his words. And I think those words tell us everything that we need to know about the enormity of the tragedy, the complexity of the challenge, and the scale of the effort ahead. No single local authority should be foolhardy to think that they are capable of coping with something as large as this and on their own. The very early lesson of this tragedy for me is that the whole of London needed to work together to deal with it as it is now and I think it is also important to know that they should have asked for help earlier. But I think with hindsight it is much easier to say those things. It is important nonetheless to recognize that there is no failure, there is no shame in asking for help for a local authority. And I know it is very difficult for local authorities to, to sort of say, well, we can't cope, can you come and help us? There are issues of sovereignty and all of those things. But I think at the end of the day, on a scale, uh, a tragedy of this scale, lives of people are probably more important than the niceties of uh, who is in charge and who is sovereign and who is not. Mr. Mayor, in your announcement you talked about uh, the contribution of the staff here in reassuring the people here. But I want also to draw your attention to, as the motion indeed does, of ones with staff who have helped out at the West West Centre. Again, it can't have been an easy job I, to, to, to deal with distraught and broken families for hour after hour after hour is a huge and draining thing. And we owe them our thanks for, for, for the effort they put into it. I think in time we want to learn from the insight so that we are better prepared should we have to cope with it. So this is an effort which is both a learning effort as well as a contributing effort. Mr. So Mayor, the, the, the forthcoming inquiry will also need to look at at what point should a local authority ask for help and if it doesn't at what point other authorities just step in. Because it might surprise you that the blue light the emergency services have ways of scaling up and reaching out, getting help and support and all of those things. And they do it day in, day out, and they do it automatically. And it's well-tried methodologies there. But for local authorities, no such thing seems to exist, and which perhaps is, explains some of the things in, 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 that happened in, in, in North Kensington. As a, as, a, as a major landlord, one that has done its best to reassure and, and, and uh, help our residents understand that their homes are safe and that we have their interest at heart. Our actions have been swift, have been decisive, and they remain ongoing. These words don't quite describe the pressure under which the housing department has worked, and I want to it's not usual, Mr. Mayor, to name individual officers in council chamber, but I do want to name one particular officer, Brian Riley, who has worked like a Trojan all the way through this crisis, led his troop, soaked up their pressures, and actually gave them leadership and support at the same time. So, Mr. Riley, thank you very much on behalf of this council and the community that you've served. <laughs> But Mr. Riley apart, the whole housing department actually has worked hard to calm the nerves of people, feel, making them feel safe. You know, the two tower blocks, the, the meetings that were held with the residents, you know, the one-to-one -one dialogues are not easy, particularly when people are actually very, very anxious. And yet, officers turned out Friday night, stayed as long as it was necessary to reassure people for as long as it was necessary. Mr. Mayor, there will be lessons to learn from Grenfell and from what we've done. We will have to test our own 
emergency services and our responsiveness. We need to upgrade, if necessary, our, our, our ways of dealing with it. Mr. Mayor, finally, I think we need to also recognize that we in this chamber uh, have come together in a, in, in a civic togetherness to understand that this tragedy is so big and so important for London as a whole and for us to learn so much from it that political differences don't quite come into it. I think it's also important that we need to tell our community that when it comes to their safety, we actually don't have a difference of politics about reassuring them of their safety. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Gibbons. Thank you. Um, the Grenfell Tower disaster is a defining tragedy for our times. Loss of life on a catastrophic scale, many families left homeless, and a chaotic response to the aftermath have made this terrible event one which resonates through our country and throughout our political system. We know that there is an inquiry into how the fire started, spread, and killed so many. We know there is to be a police investigation into the companies involved in the refurbishment work on the tower. We know there were no sprinklers and that the cladding fitted to the building did not meet fire safety standards. We have committed to ourselves to spending £30 million because in Wandsworth we have cladding that does not meet fire safety standards. We have blocks over 10 storeys high without sprinklers. We know that what happened at Grenfell could have happened in other blocks. It could have happened here. But there are many things we don't know, even the exact numbers of the dead. We have yet to ascertain whether cuts to the fire services meant that the right equipment was not available at the right time. We are still finding out more about the materials used at Grenfell. As councillors, we all have a duty to scrutinise, as did the councillors of Kensington and Chelsea. But given the complex web of 60 different companies involved in the Grenfell refurbishment, all answerable to an arm's length tenant management organisation, could those councillors really know that what was being commissioned with £10.3 million of public money was fit for purpose? A fragmented system with so many companies and agencies involved has meant less scrutiny. Paul Fuller, chair of the Fire Sector Federation, a consortium of fire safety professionals, says, we are gravely concerned in particular about the whole design, specification, supply chain and construction process. Now, we might understand how the councillors at Kensington and Chelsea faced a very challenging task in judging whether the tender had met safety regulations, except that the residents repeatedly warned about fire safety and were ignored, or worse still, silenced. As a council, when we commission, we answer to the imperative of the most economically advantageous tender. The pressure is always on costs. And this government has taken away many billions of pounds from local authority budgets, putting even greater pressure on financial decisions. Furthermore, David Cameron's regrettable promise to kill off the health and safety culture has meant that inspection has been increasingly light touch and self-regulatory. So as councillors charged with scrutiny, we must balance a quick response with a prudent response and ensure that our decisions are made with safety at the top of the agenda. And then we must rigorously monitor the work. What is utterly reprehensible is Kensington and Chelsea's lack of emergency planning. There was a faltering and uncoordinated response after the fire. The view seems to have been that people in public housing were not valued. From the miserly allowances meted out to people who had literally only the clothes they stood up in, to the idea that they could be shipped to Preston or Sunderland as long as they had a roof over their heads, the attitude was unacceptable. It was the attitude and the reaction of the Grenfell survivors, the community groups, and thousands across this country who supported them, which was inspiring. They organized themselves. They showed righteous anger at their treatment. We will be treated like human beings, they said. We will decide if we want to leave the area or not. Our voice will be heard. It won't be business as usual. From being a Tory flagship council, Kensington and Chelsea became a source of national shame. Its leader has resigned. Sajid David has been humbled and called in a team to take over the running of the council. To look at Grenfell is to look into the heart of darkness. I read that one woman escaped her flat on the 21st floor with her six children. When she got down to the bottom of the stairs, she only had four of them with her. Two had been lost in the smoke and the dark and the confusion. We are compelled to look closely into the many faces of this disaster. The law must hold those responsible to account. The government must provide funding to councils to make housing stocks safe. 
It must not use austerity as an excuse to tear up safeguards and cut even further into the fabric of our society. And we must learn other lessons. We must put public safety paramount over driving down costs. We must review emergency plans. Above all, we must listen and act on what we hear. The changes that need to be made will be far-reaching and radical. It can't be business as usual. What we approve here tonight is a start, but it will not be the end of that change. <laughs> Councillor Mrs Jane Cooper. Well, having seen the terrible scenes on the television, I felt compelled to visit Grenville Tower on the Friday and offer my personal condolences to those affected and to thank the emergency services and the many volunteers who are helping out. The sight of that tower block will be with me forever and sadly remind me of a scene I had witnessed as a teenager of a fatal fire opposite my home. We must all ensure that such a tragedy doesn't ever ha again happen in this country. As I've said already this evening, we're all pleased to see that in Wandsworth we reacted quickly and decisively. Our director wrote to 6,000 residents in our high-rise blocks on the day of the fire. And these letters, in addition to specific letters to our overclad blocks, were all hand-delivered that afternoon and evening. Again, I'm thanking the housing department staff for the speed at which these letters were delivered, which hopefully would have brought some comfort and reassurance to our residents. As we heard tonight, the director and chief executive also had meetings with our residents in Castlemaine Tower and Sudbury House in conjunction with the Borough Fire Commander to reassure our residents that they were safe to remain in their homes whilst the cladding was tested and replaced. Additional reassurance measures, including 24-7 fire marshals, have been put in place to protect our tents of those two blocks, and advice booklets and smoke alarms are made available. It will, however, take some months for suitable cladding to be made available to replace existing cladding on those two blocks, and whilst we wait, the fire marshals will, of course, remain in place. We have also contacted all our RSLs in the Borough of Wandsworth and reminded them of their obligation in terms of their residence and fire safety. In Wandsworth, we take seriously the fact that our housing tenants overwhelmingly express their desire for this council to remain as both freeholder and managing agent, and that responsibility underpinned by direct democratic accountability through the partnership between elected members and officers enables us to respond effectively and quickly to the needs of our residents, and may long that be the case. In addition to reassuring our residents, officers have also provided assistance in KNC, and the senior team led by our Director of Social Services managed the Westway Reception Centre for a number of days. We also offered 10 units of accommodation, and we did rehouse one person who self-presented the first week of the fire, and will continue to offer support and advice as necessary. Our thoughts and prayers remain with the families of those affected, and the brave officers of the London Fire Brigade. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Gibbons, could you turn your mic off, please? Thank you very much. Councillor Mrs McKinney. Thank you, Mr Mayor. When I first saw the Grenfell Tower Inferno, I was hoping that there would be stairs going down the middle of the tower, but the speed by which the flames took hold and seeing the amount of acrid smoke made me realize that even if there were stairs in the middle, away from the cladding flames, people would not be able to see where they were going and would quickly be overcome by smoke. Indeed, the report of one gentleman who was lucky enough to escape mentioned a firefighter who was lying on the floor and grabbed his foot to point out the direction of escape. Do residents in tower blocks know that the sensible thing to do in a fire is to get as low as possible? It was a warm day and many of the residents had their windows open which allowed the cladding fire entry to their flats with great speed. The advice to stay put didn't work and I know the report hasn't been released yet but it seems that for one reason or another the fire could not be contained. I cannot even begin to imagine the plight of the poor residents who are unable to escape. 
Of course, being a Roehampton and Putney Heath councillor, one of the four wards in the borough with high numbers of blocks on his of blocks on estates, my thoughts turned immediately to Roehampton and what, if any, implications there might be for us locally, as we have 42 10-storey-plus blocks. A few days after the inferno came, the shocking news that Camden Council had decided to move everyone out of the Charcourt estate blocks again, it's hard to imagine the impact on those residents. But I'm afraid I'm going to name a couple of officers as well. Um, but I have been reassured by Wandsworth Borough Council officers, such as Ian Stewart, that the Wandsworth Estates have 24-hour emergency response officers and that the London Fire Brigade undertake regular checks to familiarise themselves with the tower's layouts. I have also been reassured by Danny Edwards that none of the blocks in Roehampton have a similar cladding system. Also that all high-raise blocks, i.e. the 10 storeys upwards, have been earmarked for installation of sprinkler systems. Also, all tenanted buildings are fitted with a half-hour fire check door, and the leaseholders are encouraged to fit them as well. There are also communal fire doors which are fitted in line with the fire risk assessment that was completed, last completed in 2016. And the Wandsworth Fire Station Manager, Jackie McConshi, will be coming to the Western Area Housing Panel in July to address fire safety in tower blocks which I believe was arranged by Councillor Jane Cooper. I'd like to thank Councillor Jane Cooper for arranging this. But the residents of Roehampton remain concerned and are bringing their concerns to me. I believe they would be further reassured if they could understand how fires can be contained as the temperatures they reach can get through most materials. Also, whether we could introduce a checking system of white goods, as these do seem to be responsible for quite a few of the reported fires. Certainly, we have regular portable appliance electrical checks at work on kettles, fridges, etc. Further reassurance would be demonstrations on how to escape smoke-filled corridors and stairways, not just a written health and safety li literature. Officers can hold regular fire drills. Should we consider this for the blocks of the 10 storeys and above? I'm not a health and safety expert. I don't have all the answers but I do still have some questions and think we can build still further on the reassurance we have given so far, and I believe this cross-party motion is a step in the right direction. Several comment comment commentators have said Grenfell changes everything, and I agree. We must leave no stern stone unturned as we work together, officers and all members, to ensure nothing like Grenfell can ever happen in Wandsworth. Thank you. Councillor Grimston, uh, and you have 10 minutes, I believe. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I mean, clearly, I, I feel precisely the, the level of, of shock, I guess, is the, is the most of, the closest word as to what we've seen unfold over the course of the last uh, four weeks. And clearly, there are lessons uh, to be learned, and we must learn those lessons. And obviously, as well, I, I recognise the, uh, the sensitivity and the, and the uh, uh, point behind the motion. Points A and B are absolutely the case. And point D, and I completely agree with Councillor Mrs Dunn on the point she made in her supplementary question, uh, it was an extraordinary achievement of the officers to get that letter around the high rise the day afterwards and through the lower rise uh, a day after that. Uh, several of my residents have said to me they've talked to friends in other boroughs and they've got nothing of the sort. Uh, that is really excellent practice, and I think the officers and indeed the political leadership uh, deserve uh, uh, thorough praise for that. Nonetheless, Mr. Mayor, I do have concerns about uh, the way that uh, this has been approached uh, uh, in the borough. Uh, perhaps I can start with that letter that went around and why it was such a good uh, start to, to, the, to the operation and, and did make me feel very hopeful at that stage. Because what the letter said was firstly it quoted the statistics from the fire brigade saying that you are at no more risk of injury or death from a fire if you live in a high-rise property than if you live in any other sort of property. And let's just unpack that. That's not making a trivial comment that you're no more likely to have a chip fire if you live in high-rise than you are in a house or low-rise. That would be so obvious that it wouldn't be worth saying. What it clearly means also is when there is a fire in a high-rise building, you are more, no more at risk of injury and death 
than if a fire, similar in nature, a fire happened in a lower rise property. Now, inevitably, because the numbers at Grenfell House are so large, that's going to skew the statistics. And as, as, as we all know, as consumers of statistics, statistics become less and less uh, valuable when a single singularity, I think we'd almost call it in, in physics terms, uh, can occur and can totally change things. So I recognize that point. But nonetheless, the letter did say very clearly uh, anybody in high rise, don't, there is no need for a worry here because the evidence suggests that uh, you're at no more risk than anybody else. It then makes the point that we don't clad buildings and haven't clad buildings in Wandsworth. Subsequently, it turns out there are three exceptions to that, but nonetheless, uh, our high rise buildings in Wandsworth have simply not uh, gone through the process, which looks pretty certainly to have been the key factor in the fire spreading in the dreadful way that it actually did. So in effect what that letter was saying to residents is there is no problem here in Wandsworth that needs to be solved in the Grenfell House context. And that was an extremely valuable message because it is a true message. Uh, I'm sure resident uh, colleagues know that the first uh, high-rise blocks in London, the first mixed estate in London, was the Ackroydon estate, which happens to be in my uh, ward, where Minton Court, Timperley Court, uh, Oaklands Court, uh, Eastwick Court are the first of London's tower blocks uh, built in 1952. And for the last 65 years, those blocks have, with complete efficiency and with complete uh, uh, effectiveness, uh, saved the residents, often from their own uh, activities, the tenants and more recently the leaseholders. Uh, there has not been a single example of an initiating fire, and we have certainly had those in Wandsworth, as of course anywhere else we would have them, leading to anything like the spread that we saw at Grenfell House. And indeed, and Mr. Riley, one of the many uh, effective things that he's done in the course of the last month was to make those photos available of Sudbury House, one of the clad blocks, where there was that enormous fire in 2010. Surely a much bigger initiating event than what we think went on in Grenfell House, sufficient to actually melt the cladding outside the building, but where even in those circumstances there was no spread of the fire and residents elsewhere in the building were not under any uh, risk. And we really must hold on to those issues. There is no evidence within Wandsworth that there is a problem that requires to be solved. And if we lose sight of that, and of course what, what, the way material behaves in lab tests is very rarely the way materials behave in the real world. We have real world examples which to me carry much, much more weight than what we may be finding through these lab tests that are being carried out uh, at the moment. So I do recognise the pressure that uh, the council has found itself under because of the way other authorities have behaved. Personally, I think Camden was uh, behaved in a, a, in a way that I think was really, uh, I would be tempted to say, indefensible. We know that evacuations of any sort cause health problems, cause injuries. Uh, we know also that if residents feel that there's a bit of distrust and they are then being told, you have no choice, you have to get out of your home for an indeterminate period. That, to my mind, was an absolutely unhelpful uh, overreaction, given that these blocks uh, may not be 65 years old like the Ackroydon, but many of them are many decades uh, old. In due course, of course, the right measures should be taken on, on, on cladding. Um, to put it into a perspective, though, the danger, of course, whenever we, I'd be tempted to say, overreact in this way, in an attempt to put people's minds at rest, is you really at risk creating a lot more concerns than you were trying to solve. I'm sure I'm not the only councillor who has had people in nine-storey blocks. Eastwick Court on the Ackroydon, exactly the same design as the others, but just happens to be an eight-storey block rather than an 11-storey block. Now saying, if our houses are so dangerous that the 11-storey blocks, identical 11-storey blocks, need sprinklers, why do we not need them in our own flat here? If what you told us was true, that, we're in, that people in 11-storey blocks are at no more risk than people in nine-storey blocks are indeed low-lying low, uh, low uh, blocks like that. Indeed, I think there was almost, uh, dare I say it, a patronising attitude, uh, maybe from all sides of this chamber, towards those living in our estates, saying they're too, they, they will just panic, we need to give them a massive response to this. That wasn't what I was finding. When I was talking to the sort of people you get in housing estates, in other words, architects, structural engineers, estate agents, all of our society, all of the professionals were telling me uh, that we can absolutely <coughs> see there is no point in doing this. A couple of them were saying we're a bit worried about our flat values and if the council is going to come in and particularly if the housing revenue account ends up paying for this and it protects our house value then, then we look at it from that point of view. But 
an absolute recognition. There is no problem in terms of fire in these blocks that we've suddenly discovered because of the mistakes that were made at, at Grenfell uh, House. People living in our council estates, like anybody else, are at the end of the day pretty sensible and will recognise when there is a serious risk and when there is not. Uh, of course, that was until they were told there was a serious risk because the plans were put forward that every block needed, as a matter of urgency, these uh, sprinklers. Uh, Mr Mayor, the motion says we acted swiftly and decisively. The problem with swiftness is that quite often it can just tip over into undue uh, haste. The problem with uh, decisiveness is that sometimes it can just tip over into doing the first thing that comes to mind rather than taking a cool uh, view of what the, uh, that is going on. I was told by officers this week there are 6,283 properties in the borough, tenanted properties, waiting for works on their kitchens and bathrooms. And at the moment, the capital programme can sustain 400 of those per year. So this is a 16-year uh, backlog. The 30 million we are intending to spend on this would cover about half of that capital programme. And perhaps the one thing where I would say uh, I've been disappointed in the response is the suggestion that somehow this 30 million will not have any effect on future uh, programmes, that this is, can, be, can be taken out of borrowing or something, as if there was a, uh, dare I say, a magic money tree that could cover these sorts of, of issues. No, at the end of the day, this is money that will come from other things that residents would have required. Now, of course, if there is an active danger to life and limb, then that should be the first uh, call on the Housing Revenue Card and indeed on any public funds. But all the evidence tells us that that is simply not the case. And by evidence, I mean the practical examples of when initiating events have occurred in our housing stock which have not subsequently led to anything like Grenfell Town. In fact, that has not happened anywhere in the country as far as I'm uh, concerned. So, Mr Mayor, I hope among the lessons that we might learn are this. Firstly, we should know the legal position before we make commitments. It's by no means clear to me that the council has any powers at all to force a leaseholder to, to do anything within their own flat when the lease says very, very specifically that the lease only has obligations when it comes to the uh, common areas uh, of the flat. That surely should have been clarified before statements were made about what was going to be taken forward. More importantly, we surely should wait, should have waited, until the outcome of the technical report into what went on to make sure that, this, uh, that, that the correct uh, approach was being taken. Because the big question comes back. If it is true that high-rise is inherently no more dangerous, uh, the sprinklers, I can understand, will help in the flat where a fire has started. But the two deaths from fire that we've had, sadly, in the borough of stock in the last five years have been in a council house and in a low-rise block. Why are those residents not getting sprinklers, which would have saved, presumably saved their lives, or certainly had a chance of doing that, on this, uh, in my view, entirely unsupported idea that the tower blocks need special treatment. So, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm afraid from that point of view that, uh, full of admiration as I am for many uh, uh, measures that have been taken by the political leadership and by the officers, I think we, from a good start, we have ended up rushing into something because it looked like something to be done. Politicians' logic, as Humphrey used to say, something must be done, this is something, therefore we must <coughs> do it. Uh, that, I think, ultimately will lead to decision-making which is suboptimal, and it will end up with costs, particularly on council tenants, which at the end of the day, I suspect we could have made a much more positive contribution to those council tenants' lives if we had taken a cooler and more considered approach as to what is in the best interest for them. Maybe even ask them what's in the best interest you've had for them your ten minutes, as to how they should, uh, we should be uh, uh, recommending spending their money. Can you, can you turn your microphone off, please, Councillor Grimston? Thank you. Councillor Belton. Councillor Grimston, as ever, is, always, is very interesting and rational. Uh, can I just as a side say um, how any council can leave, leave him off a scrutiny committee of any kind uh, says something about how they value the input of backbenchers. I think it's a ludicrous mistake, but that's another matter. I'm sure most of us would have thought on the night or in the morning when one saw these events that uh, Hammersmith and Kensington and Chelsea had effectively contracted out uh, its heart and soul. And as the day wore on and the complete lack of reaction uh, became so clear and obvious, it was also 
looked as though it had con contracted out its conscience. Now, I'm not going to say that's just due, due to the slimming down of council services, but it does seem to me that there's possibly an association. I would join with everyone else in, uh, in congratulating Mr. Riley and his team on his response across the borough, but certainly to me as a councillor with two of the cladded blocks, uh, two of the three in my ward, I obviously had a great interest as well. But whilst recommending and congratulating their response, and whilst trying not to make a big political issue of it, I think we ha cannot pretend that this requires a cultural change. You can't handle this without politics. You can't handle the fact that Ken and Chelsea has no staff that could have done anything, that it was uh, just not conceivable. I, I, during the weekend when I was away, in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I came across and had a chat with Andy Clyro, who was the operational manager here for quite some time, and he spent half an hour telling me what would have happened if this event had been in Wandsworth, and how he and Mr. Buss would have uh, handled it. And knowing Andy Clyro, as you might expect, it was robust, confident, and decisive, and easier said, of course, than actually doing it. But the fact of the matter is, it relied on people to do it, people in post doing the job. And that, of course, is not a situation that is available to Ken and Chelsea. Unfortunately, it, sorry, keep, yeah, unfortunately, it's not the only disaster to hit the papers this week. Uh, Grenville is an absolute disaster, of course. But who noted that 8,400 people have died because of mistakes in modern blood transfusion methods. If I can recall, there was a blood transfusion service uh, run by the NHS on a voluntary basis that never had a problem. But some bright government decided it should be abolished and should be commercialized. So what did we do? We bought in the cheapest blood, and that blood was usually donated by people on drugs and worse uh, from other countries and 2,400 people have since died of HIV and the other one. Um, it's been a disaster on that front. Right now we're doing the same thing about building regulations. Uh, the last government, I think, was the last government, said you had building regulations uh, watching over your construction works that you employed directly, not some neutral um, observer and not the council, but you employed directly. When are we going to have a disaster on that front? When are we going to have disaster in all kinds of areas of this style because of some people's idea of, I'm sorry to use the language, a bonfire of regulations? We've got a cultural change that's coming. Councillor Lister was fond of talking about the smaller state and less regulation. Um, and obviously we would have been better at it than, uh, than, than Ken and Chelsea. But that's a battle of luck, really. And I want to make it non-political in one sense. This council was under pressure to get rid of its housing department, not by a conservative government, as it happens, but by a Labour government. Fortunately, um, from my perspective, Councillor Johnson and other and the tenants and residents fought that off and we continue to have a housing department that can operate. But we need that cultural change right through the whole of our society. We've got to recognize the role of the state and the regulator, and we've got to recognize that we cannot continue cutting those services right, left, and center across the board, regulatory services this evening, for instance. A small one, perhaps, but another one being <coughs> reduced in scale and essentially farmed out to another authority. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm sure we all agree about the words of the motion. Um, perhaps Councillor Grimston doesn't, but I understand where he's coming from. Um, and I'm sure we're all going to support it. But I think there's a fundamental political change that's required. It is a political issue, perhaps not simply a Labour versus Tories issue, though. Thank you.
Councillor Heaster. Well, thank you, Mr Mayor. I think I better change what I was going to say. Um, Mr Mayor, this dreadful fire that took place at Grenfell um, was an extraordinary event in the sense nothing like it has ever happened before. That fire acted completely out of character with any other fire that we've seen. It's baffled people how that could have occurred. We know there's going to be a criminal investigation. We know there's going to be um, an inquiry led by uh, a High Court judge. And um, we know that the local coroner's um, calling all over it as well. At the end of the day, there will be some significant lessons to be learned um, through government, through its legislation about what fire regulations are, building control regulations, um, throughout the fire service, and indeed throughout local government, because I think there's going to be a lot of lessons here. Um, I would just like to pick up on some words that a couple of our colleagues have said. Because I think the leader started this off with um, the whole idea of us trying to come together. And I think it was unfortunate uh, that Councillor Gibbons used the words he did in relation to <coughs> cuts. Um, I presume what he's talking about in the fire service is some reductions on fire stations and fire officers and indeed pumps. And indeed his colleague Sadiq Khan, when he became Mayor of London last year, said similar things about the cuts to the fire service. And he ordered a review almost on day one of becoming Mayor and appointed um, anti-Mayor to go into an inquiry for him. That inquiry found that actually the fire service was in good health and that actually those cuts had not affected the efficiency of the fire service. So Sadiq Khan, the mayor, was satisfied with that. The other point I uh, have some questions about is, is Councillor Grimston because not unusually he uh, provokes unusual thoughts. Um, but I think on this question about sprinklers, um, the fire industry would love to have fire sprinklers in all our homes. They would love fire sprinklers everywhere. And it's very simple why. Because if you have got a sprinkler in the house, it will put the fire out. And if the fire is put out, there's no smoke, you can't choke to death, then you don't die of burning terrible way to die. So of course there is a preference from the fire service in all sorts of literature saying how good it is to have um, the new modern sprinkler systems. And I think perhaps some members in the, in the chamber here aren't aware now how sophisticated sprinkler systems are. We probably all think about the sprinkler's going off and they're flooding the, they're flooding the room down rather like a power shower at home. Today, it's nothing like that. They are very sophisticated. They react to the heat in that corner and will release a mist to put it out. And if the heat in the area goes, uh, is, is spreads, another sprinkler goes off and then another. Do you know where the safest building is in, this, in, in, in London and probably in the country? It's the Shard. It's the Shard! The safest place. Why is that? Modern technology. I've had the privilege of going in the control room there and seeing exactly what happens. They've got sprinklers in the fridges. They've got sprinklers everywhere. But they are, they are uh, activated very sensitively and if there's a case of having to evacuate an area they don't evacuate the entire building, they evacuate a section of a floor, part of a floor, a whole floor, a section above, or wherever it might be. Very, very sophisticated. So, on the sprinklers aspect that Councillor Grimson raises, about, well, is it really necessary to have sprinklers? 
Well, it is a reassurance, and it's a very certain way of ensuring people's safety. So, I'll raise that. I, I've had the... Oh, it's red lights on, okay. I would just like to say that um, I've represented the council, and indeed the mayor, on fire matters for about 16 years. And I've come across some very tragic events. I've uh, had to listen to firefighters um, fighting to get into a fire to protect their comrades who unfortunately have died. I've done a review with um, Val Shellcross on the fire at Latimer's uh, house. Um, I've read for the last six years every single death that takes place in London. <laughs> Morbid curiosity, you might say, that shows dramatically to me that many of the deaths that occur at home through smoke addiction or whatever it might be are all actually, I say all, most of them actually could have been prevented. So fire prevention is the key to it all. This authority, as you would expect, Brighton Borough, has a very good regime. It's raised by uh, Councillor Cooper's <coughs> speech and indeed touched upon by the leader's speech. We have got a Council very history, good system could wind in, in up, this please. and it, therefore I believe, Mr Mayor, with those assurances um, that we will get away from knee-jerk knee um, statements and just get on with the job of making our residents safe. <laughs> Councillor Hogg. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, grateful for the quality of the debate so far and very glad to have uh, a bipartisan motion uh, to debate, which I hope will be passed unanimously. Um, I've you know, joined councillors in noting you know, some of the, the horrific stories um, that have come out and extending our sympathy to the affected families and also thanks to the emergency services and the officers who've worked so hard. I mean, I think Councillor Govindia set out the scale of the crisis very well. I mean, you can just imagine, you know, your, your entire street that you live on being burned down, you know, dozens of people being killed, including children, and, you know, everyone's belongings being lost and everyone being homeless. It's, um, it is extraordinary, and you don't often see it outside wartime, as he noted. I'd just like to pick up on a few points raised by councillors in the debate, um, you know, fire safety, towers, council housing, I think important points about our response as a council and our responsibilities as councillors. Um, I, I mean, I do think the council's response has been decisive, uh, and as I say, it has our support. Um, it is important to send a very clear signal to residents about the scale of your commitment, um, and I thought Councillor Grimston spoke very well about the detail of that, and as I hope I made clear earlier, I hope all councillors will ensure that we get value for money, that we don't do things that are counterproductive, and that this isn't forgotten. It remains a central piece of our work because it won't all get done this financial year. This, this will be a long-term commitment. And councillors uh, of all parties must play their part in that scrutiny because I think there will be uh, items to address in parallel. If we're going to each of our tower blocks, you know, will we be looking at the, uh, the fire doors, the entry phones, the windows? Uh, I think it was a good... Uh, you know, there were many requests made by residents that we couldn't accommodate, but it seems a sensible request to have some sort of PA system in tower blocks. So it's not an alarm that always goes off, but it is a way of getting across the message that actually now it's time to leave rather than just stay. Uh, in terms of council housing, I, I think this disaster has raised fundamental questions about social housing. Um, you know, we treat people differently if they live in council housing. We, we do. And we need a rethink of our responsibilities as landlords um, and also our responsibilities as neighbours. And I think post-2018 that includes a fresh thinking on allocation policies, regeneration, investment in general. Um, uh, as I say, there seems to be quite a lot of focus on tower blocks as well, and that makes this very close to home. We have more tower blocks than anywhere, uh, I think, apart from Birmingham and Glasgow, uh, more than 100 blocks. and like most political people here, I've been in most of those tower blocks. Um, two of the clad blocks are in, in Latchmere Ward and been listening to people in those blocks and was at a public meeting with the Chief Executive and uh, the Director of Housing and the, the Fire Borough Commander and thanks again to those people because, you, you know, uh, you don't dedicate decades, decades of your life to public service to providing safe housing for people. You know, th this is their nightmare. Um, so it's been very difficult. 
um, and also thank them. I know that there has been uh, at least one family in the borough directly affected by this uh, that's received excellent support. I know Councillor Alan Khan in her role as the Tooting MP has um, been involved in that directly. Would you take an intervention, Councillor Hogg? I would just like to state for the record that um, I couldn't be more grateful to council officers and to Paul Martin for ensuring that a family who were at the depths of despair, um, a tooting family who had to listen on the phone as um, their loved one was burning alive in a building with a two-year-old child present. Um, this family uh, is made up of the son of this gentleman, the mother of this gentleman and the sister of this gentleman that died. The the best that they can hope for is to find some remains of which they understand will probably not be possible. They are living with trauma beyond description and they were not receiving any of the services they so desperately require to deal with this trauma. Um, upon um, identifying this issue, we reached out to the council and on record I just want to say thank you so much to the council officers and to the chief executive who was instrumental in ensuring that they got the help they needed. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So, um, I, well, I guess Councillor Cooper made some very good points about, um, our, you know, the, the, our responsibilities as councillors and, and, you know, how, how we can, in her committee, sort of push this forwards. Um, I, but, you know, I, I don't think we can get away from the points made by Councillor Belton, Councillor Gibbons so brilliantly that, you know, decisions about cheaper cladding, whatever it might be, gas installation, it's a feature, not a bug of the system, that the prices are always driven down on these items. And I think we do need an overhaul of scrutiny as well and uh, a renewed role for members post-2018. Uh, so uh, ha having uh, g given some of that time, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up and just say, you know, I haven't mentioned political parties. I, I do think this is a political issue in that it requires an answer from politicians. And it is politicians of all kinds made the decisions that led to Grenfell Tower over decades. So I think the real test for us is, is how we learn from that and make sure nothing similar happens again. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Salia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to firstly echo the shock and sorrow that colleagues have expressed about the events at Grenfell. Um, this council holds our resident safety is absolutely paramount and I just want to assure everyone that you know, we'll continue to it is on. Is it on? Okay. Sorry, was it not on there? Um, yes, I'd just like to add my reassurance that we will do all in our power to ensure that something like that can't happen here. Uh, colleagues have spoken very well on the swift um, responses that we've made in terms of contacting tower block residents, holding public meetings, but also testing the cladding and having the very thorough London Fire Brigade inspections that um, meant that we avoided having, uh, when we passed them, the sort of evacuations that were seen in other boroughs. Uh, we've also contacted housing associations and reached out to the private sector landlords as well, so it's not just our own te tenants and, and leaseholders that we're thinking about, it's, a, it's every resident of the borough. I think it's also um, worth bearing in mind that our day-to-day -day checks have been um, found to be very robust in terms of the there's daily checks by cleaners, quarterly HSE inspections and annual um, expert inspections of the, of the fire, um, fire safety equipment. We're also lucky in that we've managed our reserves well enough to have the money to put aside for, um, to, for sprinklers and, and, for, and for cladding. I think I want to get a little bit, be a little bit careful here about second guessing any reviews. I know the issue of scrutiny in KNC has come up several times, but I think before we sort of jump in and criticise, I, I, I want to sort of wait on the review and I, I don't want to sort of force the facts into fit a, to fit a particular narrative. I, I don't agree with the characterisations um, by Councillor Gibbons that the people were being treated as subhuman or that they were being sent far, far away. I think. Um, there were possibly some administrative errors in the beginning, but I think that people have, have tried very hard to, to find homes locally for people affected and to, and to do the best that we can for them. In terms of our own officers going out and manning the Westway Centre, um, I think ev everyone involved has really strived to, to do their absolute utmost for the, for the people affected. I'm also 
sort of don't quite agree with the um, the idea that we have the same cladding. I think Councillor Grimson was correct in that we've had major fires in our overclad buildings before where the rest of the fire safety measures have held up. So the, the compartmentalisation of the apartments um, and the stay put has, has worked there for people. I, I think that in terms of best value, the sort of the idea that, that people are going for cheaper cladding, I think it's worth again saying that the safety is always paramount. Any tender always has safety and quality at its heart and it's the person that can provide that at the best cost that, w that would win a tender. Um, I just want to say finally, we're going to continue to monitor what comes out of Grenfell, what comes out of any um, of the investigations and the recommendations. We've got money aside to implement um, the recommendations swiftly and our resident safety is always going to be our number one concern. Um, and we hopefully we'll never face anything like this here in Wandsworth. <coughs> Thank you, councillors. The matter now before this council is the motion moved by Councillor Govindia and seconded by Councillor Hogg on the Grenfell Tower fire motion item 19. Please indicate by a show of hands those in favour of the motion. Those against? Abstaining. Anybody abstaining? So the result of the vote is 49 in favour, no one against and one abstention. The motion is carried.